The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine and Fine Art Connoisseur. Thank you for tuning in. We're here every day at 3 p.m. We love giving you video samples of the over 600 videos that we've produced in art instruction. And today we have a very special one. Uh, William A. Schneider, the artist out of the Chicago area, has spent his life studying the great artist Nikolai Feshin and understanding the techniques that Feshin employed in creating his fabulous paintings. Feshin, of course, was a Russian master who moved to America. So now, today, we have simply Feshin with William A. Schneider. Good morning, I'm Bill Schneider, and today we are going to be channeling Nikolai Feshin, uh, the great Russian painter who immigrated to the United States and really developed the broken tone approach. So we're gonna be focusing on broken tone. And the first thing I'm gonna do is put on a hat because the ambient light in the room will make my pupils close down, which does two bad things. It makes my vision sharper, and I don't want it sharper, I want it to be more diffused. And secondly, it inhibits my ability to see color. So I encourage my students always to wear a hat or a visor. If you have nice hair, I don't have nice hair to worry about, so I wear the hat. Uh, we're gonna start out by laying paint out on the uh, palette, which I have done for the most part. What I did here was put paint out on a paper towel, and that's actually something that Nikolai Fashion did. He wanted to suck the oil out of the paint so that it, the texture became kind of like wet chewing gum. So very thick, and in fact, he painted on a casein ground. If you think of the cheapest, crappiest, alkid-toned canvas and how sticky that is, casein is four times as sticky. So he wanted thick paint and a sticky canvas, non-slippery, so that when he dragged the paint off the brush, it would come off in chunks. And so I'm trying to do that same thing. So I have put paint out on a paper towel and you can see how it has uh, taken some of the oil and kind of absorbed into the paper towel. Fashion would leave it out overnight. Now the bad th thing about his technique is that uh, he has ended up taking so much oil out that the paint film is not as sturdy as it should be. And so his paintings are degrading to a certain extent. They're kind of falling apart a little bit, although conservators are fixing them up and the paintings are so wonderful that there is motivation to fix them up. So, so I've taken excess oil out of this so that my paint is not too soupy. So then the next thing is to set up our model. Lily is posing for us today. Can you rotate your head a little more towards me? One more tick. How's that gonna be on your neck? That's good. That's good? Okay, great. And is it gonna freak you out to look right at me for three hours? <laughs> okay, no, that's good, because I wanna be able to get your vision locked into the viewer's vision on the canvas. I think that's pretty good. What, do you normally have your head straight up and down or does it feel good to? A slight tilt? Mm -hmm. Good, let's go with that. Okay. And, I'll, and your head will drift, but I'll get you back into position as we go. But just having those little 
changes of angle because we've got the front of your body facing one direction, there, the angle of your neck is another direction, the angle of your head is a third direction. Those little angles just help to add more life to the painting. So and if you can rotate a little more that way, yeah, that way I can see both ears. Okay, good. Let me explain what colors I have on my palette. I've got transparent oxide brown, which is good for mixing very deep, warm darks. This is permanent matter deep, made by Rembrandt. And that is a great substitute for alizarin crimson. True alizarin is fugitive, meaning in very light mixtures, the red goes away over time. And so you're just left with the white. This is Rembrandt permanent red medium, which I use as a substitute for CAD red medium. This is Holbein permanent orange. This is, uh, I guess Utrecht, yellow ochre. The brand doesn't matter too much on that particular color. This is Holbein Permanent Yellow Deep and Holbein Permanent Yellow Lemon. This is a mixed white, and again, it doesn't matter too much. I actually like the Utrecht mixed white, but I think this is Rembrandt because it was on sale. This is Richeson Manganese Violet which I only use for mixing. I don't use that as a, as a true color by itself. This is ultramarine blue, the brand doesn't matter. And this is ivory black, the brand again does not matter to me too much. So that's my palette. I'm mostly going to use the Zorn palette. So I'm mostly going to use the red, the yellow ochre and the ivory black although I use some of these other colors to get certain effects. Brush-wise, I'm really gonna use two kinds. I'm gonna use these hog bristle brushes. I only buy flat, because after a while they turn into filberts just through wear and tear. And I've got rosemary long flats, which are, I think they're made of mongoose hairs. And, uh, that's kind of a softer, more sable. Uh, so I've got the bristles, the flats, and then this is a rosemary triangular flat, which is kind of nice because you can get thick strokes with it and you can get little pointy thin strokes. And a couple of palette knives, which I'm gonna to put to great use and you'll see what happens when I do that. I'm painting on um, a Raymar panel. It's got Clausen's number 15 canvas glued to it and it's the it's the gloss and service it's kind of a medium texture and I want texture because you'll see that I'm going to try to pull the paint off the brush in chunks oh and by the way we have an audience here so that I'm not talking to a camera by myself in solitary confinement so we've got Mike and Lou who may ask questions from time to time and I'll try to repeat the question so Starting in the Renaissance, artists did basically the same thing from the Renaissance to the late 1890s. And that is, they tried to depict three-dimensional reality on a two-dimensional surface using primarily value to show where something was an undercut. So if you have a dark value, it, that's some place where it goes in. If you have a light value, it's, it's a plane that sticks out towards the light. That's not what Fashion was interested in. He was not interested in creating the illusion of three-dimensionality. He was much more interested in, I think, I can't verify this because I can't talk to him, but I think he was more interested in contrast, the contrast between unfinished portions and finished portions, between smooth and broken, between thick and thin, between suggested and spelled out. And so I'm gonna to try to do that same sort of an approach today. And I've really adapted this into my own style, uh, particularly even if I'm doing the earlier version, which is a light and shadow painting, I still will use the broken strokes for the eyes and the other features. Um, I just like the way that looks. So to start, <clears throat> I need to kind of get my drawing. And 
when you're doing this sort of an approach, you really want to not fill up the tooth of the canvas early on. You want the white of the canvas showing through. And so I'm going to use this thickened paint with some of the oil taken out of it. And I'm going to not use mineral spirits during this process pretty much at all. So to do my initial drawing, I've mixed up some yellow ochre and some of this manganese violet because it's made something that's kind of a warmish, darkish, actually a warm mid-value. And I can, it'll go either direction. I can make it turn into warm or I can make it turn into cool and it won't contaminate things. If I tried to draw with ultramarine blue, then it's definitely a cool color. If I tried to draw with the, you know, any of these reds or oranges, it would definitely be warm. And if I decided I wanted that area cool, then I'd have problems. So I've got this sort of um, mid-value. And what I'm gonna do is hold this brush so lightly that it almost would fall out of my hands. In fact, I have them fall out of my hands and may happen today. But no death grip, nothing like this, nothing like the fencing position. I wanna hold it like this so that the paint will kind of slide off the brush and skip, especially in these early phases. I wanna kind of understand where I want her head to be. And this is going to basically just be a head and shoulder kind of a study. So it's a character study. So I'm deciding how big I want this. So I'm going to make her head about this size. And I'm kind of just planning out. And notice I'm extending these strokes beyond the edges of the form. I can always correct them later, but I am not at all concerned with a tight drawing. In fact, I want, see how there's all these skips in the paint already? I want that effect, I like that effect. And notice I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coloring within the lines. I'm just kind of getting the general shape, because I'm going to measure from the inside out anyway, but I want to get a sense of where I'm starting this. And she has a slight tilt to her head, so there, if I imagine a center line drawn down the middle of her face, it's at an angle like this, kind of. I'm not going to draw that in, but I'm going to keep that in mind because I'm now going to measure on her the distance from the top of her head to the inside corners of the eyes compared to corners of eyes to chin. And actually I'm gonna do it the other way around because I see more of the top of her. So I'm going from bottom of chin to the line between the inside corners of her eyes and I'm comparing that to corners of eyes to top of head. And what I see, based on my height and my angle, is that this distance, and we're gonna call this the bottom of the chin right here. So maybe it kind of goes like that. But that this distance is a little bit shorter than this distance, maybe not quite that short. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time on the measurements. What I frequently see, so I think the corners of her eyes are somewhere along that line. What I frequently see is students rushing through the measurement because they wanna hurry up and get to the good part, the painting part. And it reminds me of the old army adage, there wasn't time enough to do it right, but there was time enough to do it over. If you don't get these measurements in the right spot, then you have to start correcting and moving things around. And the more you correct, the denser the paint will get and eventually you lose the ability to have this broken stroke approach. 
So it takes a light touch and getting the right parts in the right place. Sounds like too much work already, right? So I've kind of found where her eyes are, and I think that the eyebrows, distance from top of eyebrow to top of head compared to top of eyebrow going down, if that's one unit on top, it's one, well, about one and a quarter or one and an eighth, somewhere in between there. So I think her eyebrows Probably a little bit lower than that. I think they're like right here. And notice I'm not concerned about staying in the lines. Okay. So now that I know where the eyebrow is, I can find the bottom of the nose. Top of eyebrow to bottom of nose compared to bottom of nose to chin. And again, the nose, the top part's a little bit longer than the bottom part. Part of that is a function of my height. So I'm looking a little bit down on her So this distance, a little bit shorter than this distance, not quite that much. So I think the bottom of her nose is about there. And the reason I'm using this measurement method is because I'm basically dividing the form in half. You know, some methods use, you know, a third of the way from here to here, a third from there to there, and a third to the hairline. If you have a hairline like mine, that doesn't work. And so, and also it's hard to measure in thirds. If you have three kids and ask them to divide a candy bar into thirds, somebody's going to squawk. Dividing things in half is easier. So, from base of nose on her, to the bottom of her lower lip compared to bottom of lower lip to chin. And again, that's a little bit longer. The average person, it's half, halfway. But what makes her look like her is that she has variances from the average. So I'm, I'm moving my thumb down on my measuring stick because I want to get these in pretty much the right place. So I think that's where the bottom of her lower lip is. And I can then estimate why the mid part of her lips is like here, going into the, to the top of that upper lip. So I think that's about right for vertical proportions. Then, this is a crucial measurement. I have to find the distance between the inside corner of her eyes. And so I'm going to measure on her. I'm going from corner to corner, and then I'm turning my measuring stick and comparing it to the distance from between the chin and the base of the lower lip. And I find that on her, that is exactly the same. And since she's looking pretty much straight on to me, in fact, can you rotate your head just a little bit? That perfect. It's, I've got my imaginary center line going like this. It's going to be equally spaced on that center line. So there's one corner here. Didn't want to do it that heavy. One corner there. The distance from here to here is approximately one eye. The distance between the eyes is approximately one eye. So it's a convenient way to find these measurements.
And what I'm now doing is comparing the eyes themselves. So this distance equals this distance. And that one looks about the same size. So you have nice symmetrical eyes, which is a good thing. And I'm asking myself, self, is that outer corner above, in line with, or below the inner corner? Well, I'm seeing it slightly below because of the, the tilt of her head, which I like. And I think that these, these actually have a tilt to them too. So this is the outer part of the eye. So then I can kind of lightly draw this eye in and it's going to start to give you the idea of a human being. So now I find it helpful to uh, know where the zygomatic arch is, the cheekbone, to know where the volume of the face is. So now I can kind of estimate that. I think there's one there. And there's something else here. And the width of her nose, again, I've got this imaginary center line right here. So in that same line, the wing of her nose comes to like right here. It's lined up right below the uh, corner of the eye. And I'm going to try to get rid of this little spot just so it doesn't confuse me. And this, this one is slightly on this side of this line. So I think like right here. And I'd put these, this sort of outer boundary on first, just to get a starting point. I now realize that the width of this cheek is probably different than this line that I put in. So I'm going to measure right under her nose, going perpendicular to the center line, to the edge of her cheek. I put my thumb on it, the tip on the center line, the thumb on the edge of her cheek, and I see that that distance is exactly equal to this distance. So the outer part of her cheek is really more like right here. And then what is that angle? So it kind of, it's not straight up and down, it tilts in a little bit. When I was in art school, Bill Parks used to say, think of the hour hand on a clock. So straight up and down is 12 o'clock. This is three o'clock, that's six o'clock. We're looking at the bottom part here. And then nine o'clock faces this way and then you're back to 12. So I'm judging an angle. It's like 1215. So the side of her cheek really kind of goes like this. And then it starts to turn just below where the lower lip, actually where the center of the lip is. So like here, it starts to rotate in. And then comes down this way. So I'm taking my time and kind of slowly assembling this drawing and I'm trying to be non-specific so that there's just sort of chunks of paint there. So what's the distance of this side? Well, slightly longer. So I think that the width of her cheek is here. And what is that angle? That's more extreme. That's 
like 1 o'clock. So it's not 12 o'clock. It's actually not quite 1 o'clock, but closer to it, more like that. Now, one thing that Bill Parks used to say over and over and over was, see how square you can make the round. So instead of trying to draw a curve, if you're drawing a straight line, it'll, it's easy to be more accurate and it's more powerful. So that starts to turn right about in the same place. Okay. And then her hairline is about this far above her eyebrow. It's less, it's less than eyebrow the bottom of nose. It's, it's like this. A little bit less. Then I can start filling things in. And one thing I want to do is get back and look at my effort from a distance. Because I'll start to see errors. And this wide edge uh, makes it look kind of weird. But this is going to bleed into the background, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. So this kind of goes like this. Hairs like that. The, the more accurate marks I have on here, the easier it becomes to judge. So this connects like right here, kind of goes down. And this joins like right here. Her neck kind of joins here. So I've, I've positioned her on the canvas. And I'm going to adjust things as I go along, but I don't know if I'm going to do this other shoulder. The whole point of this technique is to be very suggestive and suggestive, expressive, evocative, whatever word you want to use. Um, but it's something other than hard, sharp, tight, brittle. Those are words that I don't want to describe this. So I've kind of identified, I think, a lot of what I need. There's an inner eye socket which connects to the eyebrow. Kind of goes like that. I see a dark half tone on the side of her nose. It's almost shadow-like. But I'm going to underemphasize that. Nikolai Fashion habitually or often chose to uh, not show three dimensionality. So he would understate some of these shadows, unlike a sergeant or a Zorn who would show you a very clear shadow pattern. But this is about something other than light and shadow. And, and a lot of what this is going to be about is edge. My friend C.W. Mundy says something, or, or at least he said it at least once, and I quote him over and over again when I teach workshops, and that is, don't insult the viewer by spelling everything out. 
And so I'm not going to insult my viewer. The viewer is going to have to bring something to this painting. Yes? In a regular painting, like if you make a mistake, you now you can just go over because if your painting went in the wet. In this situation, it seems like if you make a mistake, what do you do in that situation? Because your line has to be pretty, everything has to be pretty accurate. The question is, uh, in another kind of painting, a light and shadow painting, you can make mistakes and then wipe them out and fix them. This, and paint over them. This is more unforgiving. So the precursor to this sort of painting is you gotta be able to measure and get the right parts in the right place the first time. Because if you wipe it out, like when I wipe this here, now I've got this kind of yellowish, yellow ochre stain. Um, if you do too much of that, you fill in the tooth of the canvas and you lose the effect. So yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, it depends on getting accurate drawings. That's why I'm taking such a length of time. And in fact, this is probably a good place to stop and take a break because Lily has been sitting there patiently <laughs> while I've been talking and painting and I'm sure it's more than half an hour. So let's take a break. We're back after a break, and now I'm coming back with a somewhat fresh eye, and it's making me wonder what this smear is that I put here. So I'm just going to sort of correct that. You want to take breaks. And when you take a break, you want to not look at your painting. There is a strange psychological phenomena, and it's this. Whatever you leave on your canvas very long, your brain accepts that as gospel truth and no longer perceives it as a possible error. So I can have one eye here and one eye down here and I'll look at that and think, hmm, look, looks right to me until the next morning. That's why I often say my painting was wonderful when I left it and then the evil painting trolls came out overnight and attacked it. I rarely get the good painting fairies to come out and fix them up. So I'm just refining the drawing a little bit more. And I'm gonna get rid of some of where I've kind of clogged this up a little bit here. I don't want that iris to look too big. So I need to find the corners of her mouth and they are, they stick beyond the edge of the nose and they're about lined up with the edge of her iris. So I think there's a corner like right here. And there's another corner like right here. Let's talk about symbols. This is the antithesis of drawing things. And by things, I mean, if you draw an eye, anything with a name. I don't want to draw an eye. I want to draw a collection of light and dark shapes that assemble themselves into an eye. And as artists, we tend to learn symbols for things. We learn what an eye is. If you ask a four-year-old to draw an eye, they'll probably draw an oval with a circle in the middle. If you ask a 64-year-old who is not an artist to draw an eye, they'll draw the same symbol, an oval with a circle in it. So as artists, we tend to refine our symbols so we may say, no, it's not an oval. It goes like this, then like this, then like this, then like this, but it's still a symbol. And so what I'm trying to do is get out of the world of symbols and into the world of just shapes, which is part of the beauty of this broken approach because this is all so indefinite. I'm drawing not with the edge of my brush, but with the flat part. And this is like, you know, a half inch wide brush just because I want this to be very indefinite. 
And note that you read that as a mouth, it's four marks. The two corners, the shadow underneath, and the shadow in the middle of the upper lip. But your brain fills that in. We want the viewer to bring a lot to the painting. Um, collectors are a lot like artists themselves. They start out wanting tight detail, hard edge, lots of detail. You know, they want to see every hair on the wolf's muzzle. And by the time they've been collecting for 20 years, they want to see Nikolai Fashion. And uh, so we follow the same progression as artists, I think. This is the world according to Bill. I think her head goes more like this, and I'm going to just run that off because I don't want to be terribly bound by the edges of things. Ultimately, I think you want to paint shapes that have no name and colors that have no name. So, so now I kind of know where the figure is going to be and she's going to kind of dissolve into the background. So the next thing I'm going to do is start mixing some paint for the color of her flesh in the light. And when I look at her, I'm going to start with uh, some white. And the temperature of the light in here is cool. And what I mean by that is there's more blue rays, purple rays, green rays in the light itself than there are red and orange and so on. So the temperature of the light affects everything that's in the light. So I'm going to start out. I just want to get a cool sort of tone that I'm going to be working with. And I'm not over mixing it. And that's much lighter than she looks to me. Also, I'm going to mix enough paint. I tell my students this, you can't paint without paint. I can't tell you how many times I see a student mix up a little bit of paint. They take one stroke and now all that's left on the, on the palette is a stain. But they're valiantly trying to scrape up that stain with their brush. So they have a, a half a stain on their brush. And then they're trying to scrub it into the canvas and wondering why it doesn't show up there. You can't paint without paint. Don't try it. It doesn't work. So I've got that. Now her skin tone is basically a kind of ochery orangey color. So I'm going to start to mix up some skin tone. And I'm using this blue and white mixed in with some orange. I can then hold that up next to her. And that's actually almost right for that area. I'm adding a little bit of this permanent red in just to try to adjust this. Maybe a little more orange for that area. But I also see some areas that are a little bit redder. So I'm going to put that right into the same pile. So I'm making one puddle. You know, part of it's more ochery, orangey. Part of it's a little redder. And I'm mixing that into the same pile so that the value of this will stay tight. If I mix that even as separate little piles separated by a quarter of an inch, the odds are that I'd get this much darker than that or vice versa. So by mixing one puddle, I can keep that value family tight. Now I also see some areas that are, are definitely more ochery. So I'm using some yellow ochre 
And again, some of this. And I can compare that to the ochre area. It's not quite that yellowish. So I'm graying it down a little bit. A little orangier there. I see some areas on the bottom part of her face where it gets a little greenish. So I'm mixing up a green with yellow ochre and ivory black. But that looks too dark. So I'm going to add in some of this to lighten it up a little bit. Harley Brown, who was my pastel teacher, I, I took multiple workshops with him. Very knowledgeable guy, great teacher. Um, he would give us, or he gave us a handout. And the handout, you know, said how wide are the things between the eyes and a bunch of other questions to ask ourselves. The final three questions were, how many values in the face? How many values in the face? How many values in the face? And he emphasized that because his answer was there's two. And what he really meant was there's two value families. You've got the light, which is one family, and you've got the shadow, which I haven't built yet. But that's another family. And they're like Republicans and Democrats. You keep them separate, otherwise they ruin your cocktail party. So the, the darkest value in the light must remain lighter than the lightest value in the dark. What? So the light value in the dark is probably a reflected light. The dark value in the light is probably a half tone. The half tones still have to be lighter than the reflected light in the shadow. I see an area where it gets more purpley. Actually, it gets cooler, so I will use some of this manganese violet just to cool it off a little bit. So, there is some value change here, but the key is that even though there's a value drop from here to here, it's all still going to be part of the same entity. It's still going to be lighter than my shadow colors once I mix those. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to identify the darkest dark, the lightest light, and the sharpest edge. Because I'm going to use those as a standard of comparison. So when I squint way down and look at Lily, I see that there is a dark area right over here. And I'm going to use that as my darkest dark. And I'm going to do that so that I can compare all my darks to that dark. So I think, but I still don't want to fill in the tooth of this canvas too much. I may later, but right now I want to preserve that. So that's all I'm going to put on there. It's just a reminder to me to look at that area when I'm comparing the shadows. And, then, and I had said in the beginning, this is not a light and shadow painting, so I'm going to understate the shadow pattern, but there's still going to be some shadow pattern. So that's my darkest dark. Now when I look up there and squint, what is the lightest light? I ask this question in my workshops. And people will usually say, well, I see a highlight right here. That's kind of light. And I see the light here. And then I'll say, how about the background? 
And they'll say, oh, well, I didn't mean that. I was just looking on the figure. It's the lightest light in your visual field. So the lightest light I see is actually the background, like up here. And I'm going to put a little color there just to remind myself. I may or may not use this in the final painting. So I can always scrape it out. But if this is my lightest light up here somewhere, then that'll remind me to compare, compare her skin to that so that I don't get it uh, too light right off the get-go. Okay, so that's the lightest light. And if I squint way down, well, there's hardly any sharp edges whatsoever, which is usually the case. But I do see a tiny sharp edge, and I'm going to put it in. It's the edge of her blouse against her skin. And again, this may or may not be integral to the finished painting, but I want to at least identify it so I can remind myself what to look at. So right there is my sharpest edge. The fourth dimension is intense or saturated color. But when I look up there, I see no intense color. You know, some people say, well, the lips are more intense than the rest of it, but you know, those are very grayed. So I see no intense color. I'm not gonna put an intense color there. Now I'm going to start putting on the flesh color in the light. And remember I said this painting is going to be kind of about contrast. So I'm going to put relatively thick paint on. And this is filling up the tooth of the canvas and I want it to fill up the tooth of the canvas. So I'm finding all the areas that this might fit. I see the redder areas are kind of right through here and right in here. Notice I'm not worrying about the half tone on the side of the nose. You know what I said, Fashion often understated the light and shadow. And I'm trying to do that too. Because I want this painting to be about something other than light and shadow. The portraits of Nikolai Feshin are legendary. Known for painting Native Americans and others in the West, this Russian-born portrait artist possessed incredible drawing and painting skills, which are unique and unlike any other which made his work some of the most coveted of all time, bringing record auction prices and making him highly collectible. For decades, artists have been trying to uncover the painting secrets of this Russian-trained artist to understand how he created his delicate brush strokes, his painterly effects, his incredible eyes, and how he brought out the emotions in his models so you could stare into their souls. Now you can discover the painting secrets of the great Nikolai Feshin under the guidance of award-winning artist William A. Schneider, who has deeply studied and mastered Fession's techniques, bringing them to you for the first time. Soon you'll be painting portraits with your own unique style, rooted in the great master, Nikolai Fession. And like Fession, your work will stand out from the crowd. You'll learn Fession's step-by-step process to create a portrait from a live model, from posing the model, creating the composition, starting the portrait, all the way through the final steps of completion. You'll learn Fession's unique process for creating his amazing brush techniques and signature style. Discover how Fession works with color to create unique color harmony and how to use your palette to give you freedom to focus on painting. Bill will show you how Fession created contrast and drama that translates to the viewer as a striking image and the secret technique of the five shadows, plus dozens of other tips unique to Fession. And you'll learn how Fession added to the dreamy, ethereal quality of his portraits, creating personality and movement without sacrificing the realistic feeling of the painting. 
you'll see how to create seemingly nonsensical abstract shapes that come together when viewing the portrait as a whole, and how Fashion painted amazing eyes like no other painter on earth, plus so much more. In the process, you'll uncover some of your own hidden genius through a technique you would have never tried otherwise. The Painting Secrets of Nikolai Feshin with William A. Schneider, now available on DVD or download from Lily Doll Video Productions. Well, that is William A. Schneider, and it's simply called Nikolai Feshin. It teaches his techniques. You can learn about the full-length video at lilyartvideo.com. And we have a special discount for today only. You can find the code up in the comments section. All right. Well, now let's get right to our interview with William Schneider. Well, we're here today with William Schneider, and we want to find out a little bit about his life and his career and his painting. So, Bill, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's nice to uh, spend some time with you. You and I had a a little bit of an opportunity to get acquainted before this interview. Um, we've met at various events in the past. Um, I, I'd kind of be curious, starting from the very beginning, what, uh, what were the first things that made you get interested in art? Oh, I've been interested in art since I was a kid. Um, my great-grandfather was actually a, a pretty well-known sculptor. Really? What was his name? Christian Schneider. And he did all of the uh, frieze work and the terracotta work for the Louis Sullivan buildings. So his, his work is on Lincoln Hall at the University of Illinois and the Lincoln Memorial in Springfield and the Carson Peary Scott Building and Second City and so on in Chicago. And uh, that made my family think that art was something that somebody could actually make a living at. And so they didn't discourage it. When I was nine, my grandparents bought me an oil painting set and said, go out and, and play with the oil paints, which I wouldn't do for a nine-year-old, <laughs> but they did. So I've, I've always had an interest in art, but then I had an interest in sports and music and, you know, just all over the place. So let's stop and go back to your, this was your grandfather or your great-grandfather? Great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. Did you know him? No, I never did. Okay. He passed away before I was conscious. I think that we overlapped, but I was like two when he died. Your grandfather then, was he at all into art? He uh, was a photographer and owned a photo finishing business. And so kind of in the artsy end, but it, it was really a, a very more mundane business. You know, they'd pick up film from uh, various drug stores and grocery stores and wherever and bring them back and process the film and then ship them back out to the stores. Well, they wouldn't be in business today, would they, if they no. <laughs> had to do that? Not a lot of film going on today. So you got an oil painting set. They said, go out and paint. Did you do it? I did. And did you go outdoors? Or what did uh, you No, do? I went out to the back. They had my great-grandfather's studio was still there, and it was always just called the studio. Yeah. And so I never thought about an artist's studio. I just thought that was the name of that building, and uh -huh. so... I would go there. And, and were there any remnants of that past in there? Were there old sculptures that were not unfinished? Not really. There are terracotta pieces all over my grandfather's house, some of which I have now. Uh -huh. Oh, how wonderful. And, yeah. And, and did you ever have any desire to sculpt? I have done a little bit of sculpting. I, I discovered that sculpting is 10% art, 90% construction. Yeah. And... <laughs> I wanted more immediate gratification, yeah, although I, I liked it and I think that I might take that up again, uh, but the way I would do it is do the clay, send it off and let somebody else deal with all of the rest of it. Oh, you mean the, the casting? And yeah, the casting. Oh, yeah. That's I a uh, took a class from a guy named Amri Amrani who mm -hmm. did the Michael Jordan statue that's famous in Chicago, and we, you know, made these elaborate sculptures over the, about an eight-week span and then we spent like the next 16 weeks making a mother mold and then finally casting it in uh, in concrete I, I would think the art part of it really is casting it you know creating it and then the casting is a whole different art so it makes yeah. sense so uh, you painted a little bit as a little boy mm -hmm. um, first memories of museum visits or pieces that stood out to you I took a couple of lessons when I was young uh -huh. and uh, 
you know, they had different contests when I was in grade school, you know, paint something for Poppy Day or whatever. And I seemed to do well in those and, and enjoyed that, enjoyed the recognition. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it was raining out and I couldn't go outside and play, I could draw. I would draw things with my mom. And, uh, you know, that was about it. And then I took some lessons from a local artist. And then when I went to college, I uh, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I became an art major at the University of Illinois and went from medical illustration to graphic design to fine art. And then I started playing in rock bands and couldn't handle getting up for the life drawing classes. So I switched <laughs> to something easy and I got a degree in psychology. That's easy. <laughs> compared to getting up and actually doing something for the art classes. <laughs> and so you, um, you kind of abandoned your, your painting art at that time and you went into a different form of art. Right. Tell me about that. Um, well, the highs are higher and the lows are lower than real life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was the, the late 60s going into the 70s. Um, I got in some bands that started to do pretty well regionally. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, so it, it was fun. So you were a bass player. Yeah, bass and keyboards. And keyboards. And tell me the name of the bands. Um, the first band that did anything was the One-Eyed Jacks. One-Eyed Jacks. Right. right, and that was based in Champaign, Illinois. Uh -huh. And then uh, when we formed a band called Fat Water, uh -huh. and that was different people from a, a group of other bands and put together. Uh, and then Fat Water got a, a record deal with MGM and uh, did that for a while. Fat Water broke up. I decided I should actually learned what I was doing so I went back to music school and uh, while I was in music school joined a group called the Free Theater in Chicago which was doing mixed media rock opera stuff but it was kind of a quasi semi-professional organization but it was headed by a guy named Bill Russo who mm -hmm. used to be Stan Kenton's arranger of all things wow. but he had gotten into this mixed media rock opera stuff and that's where I met my wife and uh, so we left that after I graduated from music school and put together another band. And so the last band was called Freeze. Trees? Freeze. 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 And uh, you said you had a record deal with MGM with uh, one of the bands. Yeah. Did, did you guys ever get any airplay, sell any records? We got airplay. We sold records. We just didn't sell enough records. <laughs> Although, strangely enough, you can go on iTunes and download and order the Fat Water album to this day, or at least as of a few months ago you could. Because huh. a friend of mine mentioned to me that that was available, and I said, what? You've got to be kidding. And you played bass and keyboards on that album? I played bass and I don't think I played keyboards on that. So you became a touring rock star and <laughs> wanted to, and basically did probably hundreds of gigs in a lot of different cities around for oh, yeah. years, right? Yep. And you lived on the road? Pretty much. And you had a young family at some point. You got you met your wife and got married and had, my understanding, you have five kids. Five kids. So did those kids go on the road with you? Sometimes. The uh, We both were married previously. Mm -hmm. So she had a young daughter and I had a young son. My son was living with my ex-wife at that point in Cleveland. And so he was not with me most of the time. That must have been heartbreaking. It was. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's very tough to not be around your kids. Yeah. When they're, especially when they're little like that. Yeah. But, uh, but he would come for visits. And, uh, you know, and my wife's daughter, who I adopted, would go on the road with us from time to time. But mostly she would stay home with babysitters, especially when she was in school. Uh -huh. You know, we had to keep her in school. Right. And uh, so then when my wife became pregnant with our first child together, uh, we were going to take a year off and then put the band back together. And then I, I got a straight job, a day job. And what was that? I was working in sales for a paper distributor. Okay. And uh, after a year, 
she had no interest in putting the band back together and we decided we kind of liked having some money for a change. <laughs> and so that was the end of my music career. So after the paper distributor, what happened? Um, I answered an ad for Kidder Peabody, uh -huh. which was a, a brokerage firm and they ended up hiring me and training me. So I went into the financial business. I was a retail broker for a while. And then I switched over to the institutional side mm -hmm and uh, became, they trained me in pension consulting. And I had a partner that he and I ran the uh, Midwest effort out of Chicago. And when Kidder was sold, we left and started our own firm. And so I did that for a few years, sold the firm and went to art full time. So had you been doing art throughout this, th through these various years? Had you been doing any painting or studying? Uh, a little bit. I would do two paintings a year when I was in the music business. Mm -hmm. But you can only follow one muse at a time, That's effectively. Right. Once you sold your business, it's when you really started getting into it in a, in a big way. Well, actually prior to that, I started, I went to an exhibit at the Art Institute. It was called Monet in the 90s. This uh -huh. was like 1989. So they were gearing up for the 90s. And I went and said, wow, this seeing the Rouen Cathedral series I said, this is very cool, and I could do this. And so I started taking some lessons at, uh, initially at the School of the Art Institute. Uh, the School of the Art Institute was very much into abstract expressionist, modernist stuff. So the, the drawing teachers couldn't draw very well, and the painting teachers didn't understand a lot of what I wanted to learn. So I left that and went over to the American Academy of Art in their Saturday program. And you studied with? Bill Parks. Bill Parks. Right. Legendary and, Bill Parks for so life drawing. For those who don't know, tell the Bill Parks story and some of the others that he trained. Um, Bill Parks trained a lot of the artists that are doing anything today. His students included Dan Gerhardt's, Rose Franson, Sue Lyons, Scott Burdick, Ramel Delatore, Thomas Blackshear, uh, you know, just a whole range of, of different artists. So he studied with Mosby, is that right? Correct. And Mosby is the one who taught Schmid. Right. Bill Parks and Richard Schmid were classmates. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, Bill Parks rescued an early, early Schmid painting from the garbage can and kept it for years and years and he gave it to me before he died. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Richard will probably see this and want it back. <laughs> I'll trade him. So studying with Parks for how long? I went every Saturday for eight years. While you were working? While I was working. And then what was the transition out of the entrepreneurial side of your life into the painting side of your life? Well, initially when I started doing the painting, I was, I was just doing it for fun. They have a creative outlet. And after a while, as my skills started to develop, and I started, uh, even while I was studying in the Saturday program, I started taking some workshops. I took a workshop from Harley Brown, and that was an eye-opener. And then I started taking workshops from other artists. And uh, as my skills developed, I started to realize, gee, I could, I, I'm as good as some of the things that I see in galleries. And I approached a couple of galleries, and I got in a regional one. Then I approached the Talisman Gallery in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Um, and Jody Kerberger turned me down. <laughs> she said, oh, I've got too many artists and I, I want to be able to sell enough, you know, to justify it. And it just wouldn't work out. And, you know, but thank you anyway. And I said, you know, I don't care how much you sell. It would just be an honor to be in your gallery. And for whatever reason, that, that meant something to her and she took me on. And that was my first gallery that actually was kind of a national gallery. And did it sell? Um, yeah, she sold pieces. Not like her heyday. The yeah. uh, Bartlesville used to be the headquarters of Phillips Petroleum. And so all of the Phillips Petroleum executives would come in there and buy paintings. She, she would sell, you know, she launched Richard Schmidt. She was his first major gallery, or at least that's what she alleges. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Great lady, great gallery. She was in business for 50 years, and then after the recession, or during the recession of 2008, 
you know, she shut that business down. Everything changed for everybody in, yeah. in that year. So uh, you studied uh, on workshops and Saturdays and then, and, and you're still going to work every day. There was a point at which you started going to work less Yes. and uh, painting more. Yep. Tell me about that. Um, we sold the business in 2000. And the, the way we, we sold our pension consulting business to a company called National Financial Partners. And the way they work, they buy an operating company, but they turn around and have the selling principals set up a management company. And the management company has a permanent contract to manage the operating company. So um, we still had ownership, but it was an ownership of a different entity. And uh, at that point, I started cutting back. So first I went to four days a week so that I could do three days a week on my art. Then I went to three days a week. And then it kept cutting down, and then I finally just sold it several years ago. And I've been happy ever since. Oh, you weren't happy all that time? No, I was happy all that time. I enjoyed what I did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and you, you were pretty pretty good at it from what I can tell because I don't think you probably want to share numbers here, but you told me what you got the business level up to sounded like it was pretty impressive. Yeah, that, that company is going strong to this day. Mayo Schneider and Associates. And, and that, that must feel really great to know that something you started has continued. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm proud of, about that and happy about that, but I'm glad I'm doing art full time. Yeah, so you said something I wanted to probe. Um, you went to a workshop with Harley. Yes. And you said it was a real eye opener. Tell me about that. Um, well, let me back up. When I was in Bill Park's class, after a while, he encouraged me to start using pastels in the class. And I said, I don't want to do pastel, I want to do oil paint. He said, well, you can't do oil paint in this room. And so I bought a set of pastels and started doing pastels. And I was cross hatching and, you know, doing, making little linear marks. When I went and studied with Harley, he had me break all my pastels in half and start using the broad side. Uh -huh. So my pastel technique really came from Harley Brown. Uh, but it reinforced a lot of what I'd learned at the American Academy. Um, but that it could be, that you could make pastels look like oil paintings. So Parks was a pastel teacher. Now Parks was a drawing teacher. He a taught life te drawing. Okay. He had at one point, I think, taught painting and drawing and composition and a bunch of other things. But he was in his late seventies when I started with him. And he had pared everything down to just teaching life drawing hmm. because he said that was the most important thing. So there are principles and a way of drawing that you learned from him that you're still operating on, is that correct? Oh, yeah. And Bill, Bill Parks uh, would repeat the same phrases over and over and over. And so I have his voice burned into my brain. Give me some examples. Um, okay. For those of you that get back and look at your effort from a distance, for those of you that don't, <laughs> I heard that 10,000 times. And he would do that and everybody would back up and look at the piece, get a new perspective. Uh, you know, a gesture drawing, you gesture, you start at the top, go to the bottom, find the midpoint, then work a little bit on each side, always looking, always comparing. That's Bill Park's voice coming out my mouth. So well, he, that's he was a, a that's, great, great teacher. That's an, an, an essential in teaching is the repetition because we don't always get it the first or second or third or 50th time. Yeah, that's why I took so many workshops from Harley. So you have, um, uh, you have quite a bit of diversity in your work in the sense that so many of us have a tendency to focus on one thing and, and just trying to get good at one thing is difficult. Get good at oil painting for me is difficult. But you do oil painting and you do pastels. Do you do watercolor at all? I started trying to learn watercolor uh, several months ago. And watercolor is totally backward. Right. You, you work from, you figure out where the light spaces are and then paint around them. Right. 
unlike oil paint where you start with the darks and then end up with the lights. So right. I'm struggling with watercolor. I'm not ready to show any watercolors it's to anybody a, yet. It's a challenge. And so, uh, but, but still you, you do equal amounts of pastel and oil, yes? Yes. And you also have quite a bit of difference in the styles that you do because you, you have a lot of different approaches. You're, you're not stuck in one particular way of doing things. You know, in some cases you'll paint like, like fashion, and in another case you'll paint like Sargent, in another case you'll paint like you. So tell me a little bit about that. Is that a little hard to keep track of? And um, I, for whatever reason, I am blessed or cursed with left and right brains. Uh -huh. And so uh, as I've been trying to learn, and, and the, the beauty of art is that you can never stop learning. Right. I mean, you go every hill that you go over, there's another hill beyond it. And it's constant challenge. Constant challenge. But as I've been trying to, to learn, you know, what did the artists that I really admire do, I've sort of analyzed and then broken them down. So fashion was doing something much different than Sargent. You know, all the way from the Renaissance through the late 1800s, artists were trying to depict three-dimensional reality on a two-dimensional surface. And the main tool they had to, to deal with that was value. So they're doing light and shadow paintings and the shadow, the dark of the shadow is showing you where there's an undercut. The light is where something sticks out. Uh, starting in the late 1890s, artists started to become interested in other things. Fashion, I think, was mostly interested in suggestion. He was interested in contrast, I think, or at least this is what it seems to me. Uh, so he would have sharp contrast between smooth skin surface and broken strokes for the features. The further you get from the center of interest, the more broken things tend to become. Um, so it's a, it's a different focus. And so as I've tried to learn these things, I've, I've learned different techniques that seem appropriate to, uh, to that kind of an approach. But they end up ultimately getting integrated. Mm -hmm. You know, my, when I paint, my paintings do not look like Nikolai Fashion, uh, nor do my paintings look like Sargent. But, you but use... I kind of integrate both light and shadow with broken tone, although I can isolate them and, and, and try to work on each one separately. Mm -hmm. For the student who is watching you for the first time, maybe hasn't taken a workshop from you yet, who is maybe not very experienced at all, talk about learning and the process that they should go through in learning. Uh, we talked last night about copying old masters, for instance, and you, you've learned Fashion and Sargent by copying their works, I assume, and, and also others. Can you, can you talk about what the what you think the appropriate learning process is? I think that the, the basic skill is drawing. And drawing at its core is really measurement. So when I teach workshops, you know, I'll have a workshop on broken stroke painting. But what I find is that I'm teaching half the students how to measure things. You know, what is the distance? from the bottom of the chin to the corner of the eye compared to the corner of the eye to the top of the head. Where are those eyes located relative to the, to the mass of the head? How long is the distance from the eyebrow to the nose compared to the nose to the base of the chin? These are all just proportional uh, kinds of measurements. And once people get the idea that they can measure proportions and get pretty skillful at that, then as artists we tend to learn value you know, how dark are the shadows? What's your darkest dark? What's your lightest light? How light are the lights in the skin compared to the lightest light? How dark are the shadows compared to the darkest dark? So then we start to master value. Then the next rung is edges, I think. You know, how, how sharp is an edge? You know, if I squint down at you, I see a really razor sharp edge on your shirt and if I keep squinting and look up at your eyes, they are just 
whisper soft. They're just sort of dark smears. Mm -hmm. So if I paint the relationship that I see when I squint, the edge relationship, it looks more natural. That's hard for people to learn because it's not human nature. Right. You know, when we look at somebody's eyes, we really stare at them so we can see them clearly and then we want to put them down on the canvas that way. And if you put sharp, hard edges on eyes and mouths, uh, at the best, it looks like a Stepford wife or something. <laughs> you know, it's, not, uh, it's not a good look. Because well, eyes and mouths are in motion constantly, and so if we freeze them and put hard edges on them, it doesn't look right. Right. Well, I've noticed in um, the various portraits that have been done of me by some of the greats, living greats, that that's very true. I haven't figured out how to do it myself. It's easier said than done. Uh, especially when working with a model because the tendency is to focus in on those eyes. But um, I noticed all the eyes are very soft in, yeah. in, the, in the better paintings anyway. And uh, so that's an interesting point. So if I'm a student, um, my first thing to master is drawing. Right. And what, it, it, you know, sometimes when, when I first started learning art, I didn't know it was out there. Uh, I didn't know about life drawing classes. I, you know, I basically you found out about the the old lady teaching painting at the YWCA or something, and, and it, sometimes it's hard to know what to look for. So if someone's kind of entering in, what should they be looking for, and what should they focus on in the initial part of their their journey? I would say if you can find a good life drawing teacher. Um, absent that, if you can, we are very fortunate. Nowadays, you can study with experts from all over the country via DVDs or downloads or whatever. Uh, but there are some great, great uh, art instructors. The American Academy of Art in San Francisco has got a couple of really great drawing instructors, and they have books out and they have videos out, and you can kind of get those and, and learn. I would say, the biggest thing is mileage. If you draw 100 heads trying to measure, not doing it just by eye, but trying to actually measure uh, by the 100 heads, 100th head, <laughs> it's going to be pretty good, or certainly better than the first one. In the Max Ginsburg video, Max talks about his process and the breakthrough for him was when he and his buddies hired a model um, and they started at five o'clock in the morning every day and uh, they got up every morning and, and did that model all day long, constantly. And he said, and, and you know, we would start and stop and do multiple drawings of that model. And he said, until I started getting a lot of mileage, until I was doing it every single day and doing it three or four times a day, you know, three or four different drawings a day. He said that's what really made the difference. His, his, his drawing skill went from here to, to way high in a very short period of time because he concentrated that effort. I, I think that's true. What I do and did even when I was working and do to this day, if I cannot paint during a day, at the very least, I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes drawing. And, and you can copy heads uh, out of Seventeen magazine or Allure or Glamour because they've got all of the makeup pictures. And if you, you can measure, put a center line, measure the eyes, measure all of these different things on the reference and just copy it into a notebook. And it, it's like doing scales on a piano. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to do that stuff, otherwise you start to lose it. So an artist really should carry um, a pocket notebook and a pencil and every chance they possibly get if they're waiting in line at a grocery store or anything else, just get it out and, and sketch. Yeah. The more you do, the better you get. Yeah. So the next step, okay, we've, we've gone through sketching. Is it appropriate to get into painting right away? Is it really important to master drawing first? Does it matter? Um, I think that it helps to start to get the proportions just using, you know, graphite and paper. Because if you start with oil right away, it tend, you tend to get too involved in the paint application process and how do I mix these colors and do I need the green handled brushes or the black handled ones or right. whatever. 
Uh, but I think that if once you've started to get the drawing skills, you don't have to uh, go to like an atelier sort of an approach where you're doing two years of drawing in charcoal from the plaster cast and then when you get really good at, at rendering three-dimensionality in charcoal, then you finally pick up a brush. I mean, it doesn't hurt to do that, but for the person that's trying to just uh, uh, be a good amateur, yeah. you know, that uh, approach is too grueling and they'll, they'll get bored and give it up. How they'll... do you know when, when you found yourself as an artist? You, you, you tend to paint more loosely I think, than let's say the atelier style, which uh, the classic academic style, which would be very, very tight. Now you may disagree with me. Um, and then some people paint much more loosely than you. How do you know you found your style? How do you know that you've, you've pleased yourself? Um, you want to please yourself as you go along. And uh, if you try to find a style, I, I was given this advice early on. Bill Park said it, Dan yeah. Gerhardt has said it, others have said it as well. You know, just try to be as honest as you can in representing what you see uh, because painting is, is basically editing anyway. And if you try to be honest, your style will find you. Just like it, nobody's handwriting looks like anybody else's. Right. You know, ultimately you're going to paint like yourself. And if you try to paint like something else, I mean, you can try to learn from Fashion or you can try to learn from Zorn or Sargent, which I do, but I'm never going to paint like Sargent. I'm never going to paint like Fashion. It, it, nor should you. Nor do I want to. Right. You want to be yourself. Right. So what questions would you ask Zorn or Sargent or Fashion if you had five minutes with them in heaven? <laughs> or wherever they might be. <laughs> ah, that's that's a good question. Uh, I would ask him for a critique. Oh, what a great what a great answer. Yeah, because it, you know, if I just come up with some open-ended question, that doesn't help me. I need to know. Okay, what would you do to this painting to make it better? And and I ask other artists that. You well, know. we we were talking last night about how um, I can't see things that others can see when I'm painting, and yet somebody else, my wife, will even come in and say, "Well, that eye's too high." I, and until she points it out, I don't even know it. That's why it helps to get a different perspective. So you know, to to get up, get away from your position and back up and look at it from a distance helps because it's a new perspective. Looking in a mirror is a new perspective. I have a black mirror, which is basically a piece of black plexiglass and you put that over your eyes and then look up and see the reflection of the image. So it's darkened and inverted, gives you another new perspective. When you take breaks, don't sit and look at your painting. Go away, look at something else and then come back, try to have a fresh eye. Mm -hmm. There's a, a strange psychological phenomena, I think, that whatever we put on our canvas, if we leave it there very long, our brains accept that as gospel truth. Setup is a black background and the model's lit in front of it, so the model's light and the background's dark, and we leave the white canvas there very long, our brain accepts that the relationship between what we've drawn and the white canvas somehow equals the same relationship as the light model against the dark background. And then it tries to run the math internally, subconsciously, that makes that work, and which of course it can't. And so then, then it kind of blows up the hard drive. One of the things that I think was very important for me to learn, uh, I don't practice it like I should, but um, you can't make a mistake, you can start over. You can scrape down, you can change it, you, you, you don't have to complete what it is you've started. It, but the minute you'd stop feeling good about it, then you've got to revisit that. Because what, what some of us, I think, tend to do is we get so invested in what we've done so far. You know, I really like the way I did that 
fingernail or that nose or, or whatever, and then we fall in love with it like you say, and we can't see it clearly. So one of the things I've found very freedom, very, very freeing is the ability to not be so invested to say, okay, it's all right to scrape it down, it's okay to start over, it's okay to take it off and never do it again, or um, just completely ignore it for a while. Sometimes I'll put a painting down for a year or two years and I'll pick it up and I'll see it completely differently. Do you have that same kind of sense or is, do you do oh, it, sure. approach it differently? Absolutely. I've gotten paintings back from galleries and when they come back, I thought it was pretty good when I shipped it out, <laughs> but the evil painting trolls attacked it while it was in the gallery, apparently. Yeah. And it came back to me, and I could see all of these things that are wrong. And I've, the, the beauty of oil paint is that you can kind of sand off the big peaks and work over it. Right. And I've repainted paintings right on the same painting and then shipped them out again, and they sell immediately. So hopefully as you grow, you start to spot... Uh, errors and and you're uh, coming at it with a fresh eye. That's I think part of it. Uh, who who would you say are the influences, um, contemporary influences that um, impact you today in terms of their style of painting or what you've learned from them or perhaps uh, historical influences that have a lot of meaning to you. Um, influences for me have been Sargent. Zorn, Nikolai Fashion, uh, contemporary people, Richard Schmid, of course. His writing, I've read A La Prima cover to cover probably five times. Uh, Dan Gerhardt's, I paint with Dan quite a bit. And he is, in my opinion, not only one of the best that's alive today, but one of the best of all time. Uh, so there's, you know, th th I get influenced by a lot of different people. It's like if you're a musician, uh, the way, if you're a rock musician, you learn by copying, you know, Bob Seger and then, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and others, and you, you pull from a hundred different musicians and, and it gradually gets incorporated and you learn all these different parts, something from one person. So I, it's the same way with painting. You know, I, I pick up a little nugget from David LaFell or a little nugget from Carolyn Anderson or Harley Brown or, you know, hundreds of artists. You mentioned to me um, an artist that I don't hear about very often. Uh, we, we oftentimes hear of the Zorn and the Sargent influences, the fashion, but you, you were talking about Mucha last night and some of the design principles you've learned from him which I assume you'll be sharing in your demonstration. But you want to talk about Mooka at all? Um, Mooka was a phenomenal designer. And he's well known for the posters that he did, which sort of embody that, you know, the Sarah Bernhardt posters and then right. the job cigarettes and so on. You know the story of how he got that poster? Mm, not exactly. Well, he was, he was living in Paris and starving. And uh, Sarah Bernhardt decided to do a new show and needed a poster on Christmas Eve, and all the people she contacted couldn't do it. And somehow she encountered him, and he said, I'll do it. And he did it, and essentially he did it in the Art Nouveau style, which really nobody had seen at the time, and it completely made his career because of being associated with her. Yeah, I, I had not heard that story, but <laughs> so I he can got see lucky. that. He, and then he did a whole bunch of posters for her. Yes. And, and he basically invented that Art Nouveau style. Right. right. But the underlying principle, I have a, a little manual that he wrote on design, and it's basically the uh, ratio of two-fifths to three-fifths. So you can put a center of interest two-fifths from the left and three-fifths from the right, and it'll look kind of right. But then you can divide one of the spaces in two to three again and two to three from the top, or you can put two above and three below, and it becomes this very open-ended, branching sort of way to design the pictorial space, but it has this internal logic, so it looks right, even though you can't tell exactly why it looks right. What do you hope to impart on the world? Uh, how do you want to be remembered, and what is important for people to remember about you? 
Hmm. That's an interesting subject. I, I haven't given any thought to that, what, what's important to be remembered about me. I would hope, I think, that uh, eventually somebody will think I was a pretty decent artist and that I wasn't a jerk and that uh, I was willing to share some of this. Mm -hmm. That's why I teach. I, uh, uh, one of my friends said, there's two reasons you should teach. One, you studied with great artists and you owe it to the world to pass that on, which I believe is true. And two, uh, it'll make you better. It may not help them so much, but it'll certainly help you, which, both of which I've found to be true. Um, so, I, you know, I would have to give that a lot more thought. You know, the, the way the world remembers me is probably going to be mostly, I hope that my family <laughs> remembers me fondly and not as the guy that went off and locked himself in his studio and they never saw him too much. So, uh, I don't know if that's a great answer, but, you know. Well, it's coming from your heart. It is. That's what matters. So. Well, this has been very refreshing and a really good interview, and I really appreciate you taking the time today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Well, that was William A. Schneider, and of course the video is called The Techniques of Nikolai Fashion. You can learn more about the video at lilyartvideo.com. And of course, you can use the discount code today only. The code is found up in the comments section. We also have for you, in case you've just tuned in for the first time, we have a free video. You can get it digitally or on DVD. And it's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets from the World's Best Artist. You're going to find it very helpful. And it's free for you. It's a normally $107 value and you can get it for free at 97tips.com. Well, thanks. We'll see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Appreciate you watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. The portraits of Nikolai Feshin are legendary. Known for painting Native Americans and others in the West, this Russian-born portrait artist possessed incredible drawing and painting skills, which are unique and unlike any other which made his work some of the most coveted of all time, bringing record auction prices and making him highly collectible. For decades, artists have been trying to uncover the painting secrets of this Russian-trained artist to understand how he created his delicate brush strokes, his painterly effects, his incredible eyes, and how he brought out the emotions in his models so you could stare into their souls. Now you can discover the painting secrets of the great Nikolai Feshin, under the guidance of award-winning artist, William A. Schneider, who has deeply studied and mastered Fession's techniques, bringing them to you for the first time. Soon you'll be painting portraits with your own unique style, rooted in the great master, Nikolai Fession. And like Fession, your work will stand out from the crowd. You'll learn Fession's step-by-step -step process to create a portrait from a live model, from posing the model, creating the composition, Starting the portrait, all the way through the final steps of completion, you'll learn Fession's unique process for creating his amazing brush techniques and signature style. Discover how Fession works with color to create unique color harmony, and how to use your palette to give you freedom to focus on painting. Bill will show you how Fession created contrast and drama that translates to the viewer as a striking image, and the secret technique of the five shadows, plus dozens of other tips unique to Fession. And you'll learn how Fashion added to the dreamy, ethereal quality of his portraits, creating personality and movement without sacrificing the realistic feeling of the painting. You'll see how to create seemingly nonsensical abstract shapes that come together when viewing the portrait as a whole, and how Fashion painted amazing eyes like no other painter on earth, plus so much more. In the process, you'll uncover some of your own hidden genius through a technique you would have never tried otherwise. The Painting Secrets of Nikolai Fashion with William A. Schneider, now available on DVD or download from Lily